Yes, your congenial hosts for this grand occasion, Mr. Spike and Mr. Jones. Sleeping Beauty, 
and he was reviewing the concept backgrounds for the film, he obviously sees something shocking. Just look at his eyes. I think it's the budget. Is what he is. <laughs> oh my God. That's not what we discussed. This is the most extensive movie that the company ever made. And I think if you took that the dollar figure from that era and moved it up to today, it would be right up there with Star Wars. And, 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 I think it was six million dollars. Six million in 1959. And it was in production from the, you know, like 1952 on, so it just went on and on and on. This is the whole background department there. Yeah, that's that's uh, Thelma with with her, uh, and then uh, Ivan Earl, and Anthony Rizzo, and Walt Perry. Who's Walt still with us? Yeah. Right. Or I worked with Paul in Imagineering. He did uh, some of the Journey into Imagination the first the round. So. Oh, stop over here! Yeah. Thank you. He did the art area. You remember the white area with all the sculptures? That was Walt Perry. Yeah. Well, now let's talk about the look of the film itself. Yes, okay. Well, Ivan had a distinct style. He went on to become a great artist in his own right after leaving Disney, and in fact, he was renowned for his cards. And if you go online, you can find a lot of Ivan Earl Christmas cards that are very reminiscent of this movie. A lot of the animators have found it difficult to work with such a complicated background, but like I say, if you were into animation, that might be a problem, but if you're into art, and my uh, being working here with the parks for my whole career, doing attractions that you get to go into, I think I really love this style because I dreamed of going into these worlds that Ivan had put down there. And for me, you know, once you go through Snow White, and, and I don't mean to put these down, and, and Cinderella and Alice and so forth, um, the characters are great and everything, but the backgrounds don't really invite me in as much as Sleeping Beauty does. So I would go, I would pay anything to live there. I think that would be fantastic to live in this world. But his style is kind of unique in the sense that it's, it's very graphic. Yes, yeah, it's very graphic. It combined a graphic look that was kind of very uh, typical of the 50s. It started with UPA, an animation house, that was kind of a competitor of Walt's that did very brash, very simple design. So there's a simplicity in it. And yet, it's overflowing with detail. And that rigid effect is something that was traditional to uh, Gothic design. And, uh, and so you see it reflected in European tapestries and some of the books that we we studied when we were doing Disneyland Paris, like the Book of the Hours by the Duke de Berry, uh, was used by Ivan Earl in, in styling this film as well. And, and the film is also noted for making square trees pocket. Yes. <laughs> when we went when we were doing the castle in Paris, we thought, what can we frame this out with that the French haven't seen? Because everything in France is beautiful. Well, they don't have any square trees, to my knowledge. So we do have square trees in front of our castle. There you go. Yeah. Well, now, we have Sleeping Beauty Castle here at Disneyland, but the castle in the film is somewhat kind of nondescript. Yeah, it kept changing. Every view, it looked different. Now, the interesting thing is when Disneyland opened, it was 1955. This movie came out four years later. So, Walt, always thinking ahead, realized that if I made it Snow White's castle, which was the original intent, it really wouldn't do him any good. Whereas four years down the road, by making it Sleeping Beauty's castle here at Disneyland, it would be the brand new film. So they went with that title. But if you look at these four versions, you can't really see any reflection of the Disneyland cast on that. They're very, very different. And from each view, they look different. Probably that black and white one at the top is the most familiar with what Disneyland's cast looks like. This next shot, I love this. This yes. is a great painting that, that encompasses the castle and square trees. Yeah, and, and he had worked out a formula of how to put the paint down. Starting with dark shapes and then adding more and more detail and getting lighter and lighter. And then he was able to train everybody in the background department to pretty well do a facsimile of Ivan Earl. But he was rather proud and he often would say, I did practically every key drawing in that movie that's on the screen. Yeah. Well, now I'm, I'm making fun of the trees and, yeah. and everything in this. But when you did work on Disneyland Paris, you yes. really looked at this film quite clearly. I didn't have to. I did the film frame by frame. And, <laughs> and also... So did I. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this painting was done by Frank Armitage. Uh, and Frank had also worked on uh, the movie Sleeping Beauty. So he knew intuitively how to get right back into this style. And so we said, okay, we, we finalized the design for Paris out of all the amalgam of those various versions from the movie and a little bit of Disneyland from the color. If you look at the color there, that's absolutely from the Disneyland castle here. 
and then um, a little bit of the book of the hours and whatnot. So I think Frank did a great job. This became the PR art uh, that was on the opening day tickets and everything for Disneyland Paris. And we really looked up to that. It's not just like Sleeping Beauty on the outside, but it really rolls in through the whole uh, castle. Well, so, look how well, look at this rendering behind me. And look how much it looks like in real life. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And even yeah. square trees. Square trees and that very Ivan Earl rock work that's going out the side. Now that's actually part of the castle. Uh, part of the illusion here was to create the sense that that castle is up on a hill rather than flat, and yet we have the same coves and whatnot that we have here in California. So while indeed it's pretty flat, we achieved that look of it being high on the top of a, a, a hill. Now, underneath that rock work is kind of a really neat surprise. I think you got a picture of that. Well, we have one coming up, but inside yeah. the castle proper yeah. is, is a walkway, a walkthrough itself. Yeah. Tracy Trennis, who worked here at Disneyland, did that poster for Tom Morris, who was the designer of the castle. But the neat thing there, if you look at that stained glass, it was done by the English, the Queen, the, whole, the Royal Court's uh, famed stained glass house. This fellow who was 85 years old, came out of retirement, and we said, we're really pleased that you decided to do this for us, but why at 85? Because my whole life I've been doing stained glass that terrifies people, you know, <laughs> you know, shame on you, agony, misery, all of that. And he said, I would love to do something where people come and they smile and they love what I have done. And so that that you can see when you go through the castle and it is absolutely beautiful. There are people. Yeah, there are people. But underneath that hill is this yes. fellow right here. And this is the, the dragon. All my life, I, I remember the dragon when I was 12 years old. It impressed me more than anything. And, Years later, in an L.A. film uh, series that they ran at the Brahmins Chinese, the, the statement in the catalog said, never before and never since in 70 millimeter has the screen been electrified with such a great sequence as the conclusion of this motion picture. And that was said about 20 years ago, and I would say it's still true to this day, that as it builds up to that climax, um, whatever you think of the rest of the movie, you cannot deny that isn't the coolest thing ever done. You know, so. We put him down in the basement. It isn't counted as capacity. You have to walk down a creepy stairway into this cavern, and he's sleeping a lot. And then every once in a while, he comes to life and breathes out some fire. It came up as the number three thing of all the attractions, including Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion. This was number three in the whole park when we opened. Now, so, while we're in Europe, Yes. Since we're here in Paris, let's move over to Bavaria. Yeah. And look at the inspiration for Sleeping Beauty Castle here in Disney. Yeah, now remember, initially it was going to be Snow White's castle. Right. So they went to Bavaria, and, and, and what people don't realize is Neuschwanstein is also a tourist attraction. It has you know, electricity, and it has uh, forced air heating and everything. It was built in the 1880s, around in that period. So it was built as a fake castle, just in the same way. So Walt was sort of borrowing from something that already had been created as a castle. Now, look closely at that center arch in the middle of, below the turret, and you'll see a lot of familiarity to the backside of Disneyland's castle. Right. And uh, but, yeah, let's talk about the fellow who actually designed yeah, the castle. Yeah. That'd be Herb Ryman. Herb Ryman put it all together, and you can see the final look there uh, of the castle that we know today. But it wasn't all this that way. No, I love this sketch. This is from the Disneyland schematic yes. that Herbie did. And you can see that that surface that was the front of the Neuschwanstein Castle was actually the front of our Disneyland Castle. And one day when they were getting ready to show it to Walt, they took that part off to dust the model, and the guy inadvertently put it on backwards. Yep. And there it is how it was supposed to look. And when they put it on backwards, Walt said, I really like it that way better. And I'm glad he did, because if you saw this, you'd go, oh, that, that's Neuschwanstein in Germany. So, so yeah, tell me by accident that Sleeping Beauty Castle looks the way it does today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. that's how the best things happen. Sure. You know, Spontaneous. If I would have had been given the job to do Sleeping Beauty the way he did, it wouldn't be the most beautiful film that's ever been done. So. <laughs> That's a biased opinion. I know. <laughs> what can I say? Now, we always hear about Herbie Ryman designing the castle, but, but Ivan Earl worked on the castle as well. Well, the great thing back in those days, um, they didn't have divisions and departments and all that, and you had projects. And so whatever it took to get the project uh, done was what you did. And so Ivan had finished, uh, you know, uh, some of the work on his 
probably at the same time. So he was doing double duty on this, and he also was uh, brought in about a couple of years later when they started on the show inside and did all the styling for that too, which we'll see in a minute. But I love the fact that Walt used the castle so so much yeah. to promote Disneyland the place and Disneyland the TV. Well, it was brilliant. The year before Disneyland opened, they started the TV show on ABC, and it opened with that castle every week. So. For a little kid growing up at that point in time, you knew where everything was, how it was laid out, what a Frontierland and a Fantasyland were uh, before the doors opened. You can see that sign down there that talks about that model was done before the TV series started in September of that year before Disneyland opened. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Warming up the audience. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And it was how they got the dollars to build Disneyland because the partnership with ABC, who presented the show at that time, got him the extra money he needed to finish the car. Which is interesting because now ABC yeah, is in fact, part of the family. Yeah. So you have this model, so Walt starts working on the castle. There's yeah. Walt yeah. with the uh, castle under construction. And this was the very first use of fiberglass, so a lot of it is still the same kind of construction you'd see today in homes built around Orange County, but they were experimenting with this new magical formula of fiberglass, so a lot of the turrets and very intricate parts were done uh, out of molds, uh, the way that we do much of our final, fine detail today. So after construction of the castle, I love this next shot. That's the castle on opening day, as seen in the uh, opening day TV special. But I love the fact that you can see straight through the yeah. windows, there's nothing in it. There it's was nothing there. there. In fact, the first walkthrough was going to go outside and walk around on a parapet which the, the handrail is about this tall. Yeah, that's not going to work. Now, if you look at the trees behind that, some of them are on the berm right next to us right now. When you go out, you'll see those same eucalyptus trees right all over right along here. So they still exist. Now, this next shot of a castle, of Sleeping Beauty Castle, you may not recognize, but Tony certainly does. Tony, okay. tell us yeah. about this. This is in my backyard, okay? So I was 15, my mom taught school, and I borrowed some great paper and all this stuff, you know, construction paper and toothpicks from her being a teacher, and I built this little model. And it looked pretty good from the front. I wouldn't want you to see the back because I didn't have, a, I didn't have the guidebook that guided me on it. So my mom said, let's enter at the Orange County Fair, and we did, and I won a blue ribbon, and I got my name to the register. There you go. <laughs> Now let's talk about what the walkthrough looked yes. like in 1957. 57, two years before the film came out, they opened an amazing walkthrough. And the best part of it was when you left the walkthrough, you got this beautiful, it was like a movie program book with massive fold out in the middle of one of the scenes from the film. And uh, that was like a B ticket, 25 cents, you know, for this thing. So you would always use your B ticket just to get a stash of these uh, programs. This is kind of a diagram that we did a few years ago for the uh, previous issue of the Sleeping Beauty Blu-ray disc. And you can see how, you, how they crammed in all of these various sequences into that very tiny castle. The interesting thing that was missing in that exhibit was the dragon. And it's brought up all kinds of speculation. And one story I heard was that at the end of the movie, Maleficent was going to send the goons to fight Philip in the thorns at the front of Sleeping Beauty Castle. And Walt saw it and said, you know, we've already done the goons when Philip was escaping from Maleficent's domain, so why don't we do something bigger, something that would really eclipse the goons? Well, maybe that came along after this castle. Who knows? We'll never know. But it was not part of this show. Now let's let's roll through a couple images of Ivan Girl's concept yeah. for the castle. Yeah. Ivan Girl was so prolific, there are hundreds and hundreds of sketches that have turned up both for the movie and for this walkthrough. And sometimes it's hard to tell, but we've been able to, you know, you can tell if it's sort of a window that you'd be looking in, and it was probably done as these were for the uh, castle here at Disneyland. What I really love about these is his understanding of lighting in a different media, because these weren't done to be done as movies. These were done to be real theatrical sets that you'd be looking at. And they have, rather than movie lighting to me, they have more of uh, the setting, the lighting that we find on a theatrical stage. I love this one. This, yeah. this one illustrates yeah. perfect. I think we have some behind the scenes stuff on this one. Uh, it's coming up. Yeah. This is very atmospheric, this next yeah. one. 
Yeah, this was a demented scene, I think. I don't know, somebody must have been having a party night when they came up with it, but it was spinning wheels. You didn't hear that, and I don't want it on the internet. <laughs> I said, a party? What, what, your mind is going I'm just the watching the show. Okay. okay, so these were all reflected in mirrors and lit with black light, and when we tried to duplicate this for the, uh, the video, it was very, very hard to figure out how they positioned all the lighting so it didn't reflect in the mirrors. But as a kid, you can get transfixed standing in front of this window, and you can see spinning wheels going forever, just around and around, and they had a cycle of music. It's like really, really bizarre with that. Just the lips of two eyes. I love this one, it's very dramatic. All the effects in here were really the test bed for the Haunted Mansion. You've heard of Pepper's Ghost and the Grand Ballroom and everything, but all of these things were proven out in miniature, almost like using models, in this case the castle, to develop the techniques that would later be full size over in the Haunted Mansion. Well, speaking of haunting, this is my, my favorite effect. Yeah, now this one we found, and we couldn't figure out what it was, and so we found a drawing that showed after the happily ever after scene where the, the prince kisses Aurora, you went down the last hall, and then when everybody is feeling relaxed, out from behind the wall came the shadow of Maleficent and a hideous laugh. And so we said when we were repositioning the castle a few years back, I said, let's put that back in. Kids are stronger today. <laughs> so it's in there now. Yeah. So uh, I love this next shot. I've never seen this before. So yeah. there's wall and flat coats and Ken Anderson working on the diorama. Well, Claude Coates became my mentor. He, uh, didn't, you know, I didn't know, but when I was working here and I was an ice cream scooper, I snuck into the pirate ride and he gave you this incredible walkthrough tour. Do not, do not say that you heard that today. I don't want to give anyone any ideas about the future. But anyway, years later, I went to work with him and we, worked, we were partners on so many shows. And he was an older man compared to my age. I was in my 20s and he in his 70s, but it was like we were best buds. It was just incredible. And Ken went on to be our guide to the whole rebuilding of Fantasyland here. And uh, Ken had done all the storybook land villages. So this guy, while we were talking about what are we going to do for Mr. Toad, he would literally sketch out like the facade. He goes, well, why don't you just build to Toad Hall? And there it was. And his sketch was everything we needed to take it from there into architecture. Was that good? He now, was a genius. Take us through uh, the force perspective of creating these dioramas. And we have some, yeah. some images here. We'll, well you know, because the castle is in such a reduced perspective in there, we had to telescope down the depth into things that maybe three feet deep. But when you look through the window, you're expecting it to be like maybe 10 or 15 feet deep. So there's a lot of uh, bands in there where we're shooting into glass. Uh, and you're seeing something that's really over here that looks to you like it's out there because there's a 45 degree panel that's giving you the sense that it's over there when in fact it's really over here. But don't look over there, it'll ruin the illusion. <laughs> so, but you can see the glass, if you look carefully there, you can see uh, that line right over to the, what would it be, the uh, right side of Aurora laying on the bed. You can see a line there, that's actually the plate of glass in this model that shows you where we're introducing the sparkle effect that uh, dominates the scene of the Sleeping Princess. So that ray of light and all the sparkles is actually being reflected off of that panel of glass. And uh, doing the show over as we did for the attraction a few years back was great because so many of the younger people like Chris Merritt, who's now working over in uh, Shanghai, uh, they got their, they got to test their wings doing all these effects that Yale Gracie and Bob uh, Kerr and all the geniuses who did this the first time and, uh, years ago. Now there was one section of the old walkthrough that didn't make it in the redo. <laughs> Only <laughs> one? Well, this, this one I always thought was kind of weird, but I yeah, loved it, it was as a kid. Oh, as a kid it was great. They had a tape recorder in there that had a loop of tape and you'd go up and you'd go, <laughs> hello, 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 and we'd just play back. Uh, your voice over and over again. It was a It was wonderful, except most of the kids that went up to it didn't say hello, hello, hello. <laughs> and it is Disneyland, you know. Don't give this front row any ideas. They look suspicious. Well, we debated about putting it back in, but while well, kids are a little bit, you know, we, we ended up not doing it. <laughs> now, if you were talking about kind of the cramped quarters of putting this uh, attraction, this walkthrough, 
but it actually works quite well. Yeah, it was funny because at the time it had been closed for like 10 years. And I was talking casually to Ed Breer, who is president here. I said, we're doing this thing for the Blu-ray, and it's really neat. And I showed it to him. I had a rough cut. And he goes, wait a minute. Florida has an interior to their castle. Disney does not. And I said, yes, we do. So he called security and he said, I'm going to be out at the castle of Tony in about 10 minutes. I want someone with a key so we can go in. And you couldn't believe what we found. I mean, it looked like an abandoned haunted house, and there was so much broken debris and whatnot in there. But he said, if you can pull this off and get it done by the time that that DVD comes out, you've got a project. So we did it. Yeah. Now let's yay! Uh, is the opening of the walkthrough in '57? Yes. Anybody remember Shirley Temple? Yeah. Well, she does. She that's her son is about the age that you remember her at. Wearing the queen outfit there, the princess outfit with Walt. And it was his birthday, I believe, that day too. So it was kind of a cool day for Shirley. I love the fact they have her in a crown on a cave yeah. and all that. Now let's let's jump forward to 2008 when mm -hmm. the castle reopened. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because Ed says, Can you get it done on that day? And we, we actually worked with the studio to put a uh, teaser on the end of the, the film, Blu ray, that said, Watch for the Awakening of Sleeping Beauty Castle. And I remember they said to me, if this doesn't go forward, you're going to have to pay to refresh all of these little brains. <laughs> so I'm like sweating bullets. So we came up with a clever sign. Maybe some of you can remember it. It said something like, before the last leaf of autumn falls, Sleeping Beauty will once again embrace these halls. Now, in California, autumn ends somewhere in January. <laughs> <laughs> It's called whatever works. Yeah. Right. Well, let's let's hop, skip, and jump through the attraction as, as we know it today. Yeah. And here's some of those great examples. Yeah. Remember the odd general concepts we saw earlier, and here's the finished product. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to. We had a lot of the original drawings that Ken Anderson and Mark Davis had done, and we had a great uh, team of young talent on this that was able to really cut their teeth on this. Now you even found some old props. Yeah, we did. One fellow over in, in maintenance had actually saved the Maleficent, uh, and she was still in working order, but we were so pleased to have it, we actually donated it to the archives and, and did a new one for the ride. So, yeah. And yet, this is not a scene of the film. No, this is, uh, this is that scene where we have the Maleficent. It's really hard to see. But she's up there. That's the one that we actually found the original. So that is, that is exactly a copy of that. But the next one, yes. Remember I told you the dragon wasn't in the original show. So we got to the bottomless pit. And while we were digging through everything, I found this original Ivan Girl that is not how the movie ends. It's a different view that I found to be even more, and I'm a fanatic on this, but it looks even more dramatic to me than the staging at the end of the movie, which is on the bridge. But it looked like that overwhelming thick form for us. So here is an animation that we did based on that design. And this is what you find now at the, uh, near the climax of the yeah, castle. It's a, it's a great finale to the walk. Let's take a look. Yeah, so this is all new. Oops. Oh, well, that didn't work. I oh my goodness, something's going wrong. Yeah, that never happens at Disneyland. No. Like this scene where, are we going to see it or not see it? There we go. There we go. Paint them with red blacklight paint so they would glow. 
So I brought them back, it was about 9 o'clock. Everybody dropped what we were doing, and we dipped all these flowers in white paint and put them under heat lamps. And literally that next morning, they were still drilling holes to get this scene in <laughs> before it opened. But it looks really good. Yeah, so anyway, it worked out. But those are for Michaels. <laughs> I was about to say, so much for the deep dark secrets I about the mirror. Well, that's why you came to this, right? Yeah. Well, that, uh, that kind of wraps us up on our beloved Sleeping Beauty Castle here. But one aspect, one aspect of the attraction of the walkthrough that we haven't talked about is the fantastic, you just heard a moment ago, the fantastic music yes. this walkthrough has. So talk to us and the movie bit. has. Yeah, or talk to us a little bit about the music. Well, it, of course, it's based on Tchaikovsky's uh, ballet. It's, it's, it, it, you know, a lot of people say today it is not associated so much with the ballet as it's associated with this movie. And I can't hear some of the main um, themes from it without hearing the lyrics that were written for the film. And uh, it's one of those things where. It's almost like he must have known that someday there would be some form of media that would marry to what he had written. And uh, this was a marriage made in heaven. And going back to my premise about it being artwork, I think classical music works better with artwork than perhaps some of the lighter scores that were done for um, other films. This film does have one of the original songs still in it that was written by Sam Fain, uh, I Know You. Uh, but most of them were, you know, uh, jettisoned in favor of going with just this rich classical score. And again, I think for me, it makes it highly rewatchable because it's just a soothing bit of wallpaper. It's like a big painting in my room that comes to life and I can do whatever I'm doing and occasionally look up at that and see and hear something that is extraordinary. Well, the man that I, I envy and, and admire most is George Bruns. Yes who put together all the music for the film. That's he had to take, what was it, four hours of music and condense it down to fit an animated feature. Well, and then create bridges, because some of George's bridges are as uh, beautifully observed as anything Tchaikovsky wrote. Um, and they flow right in, as though it's part of the original work. You can't really tell what is and what is original. I think right. that's also true to his. Well, and the, and the other thing the film has going for is the gorgeous voice of Mary Costner. Yes, yeah. And, pretty, yeah. And, you know, if, if you've ever had the opportunity to meet Mary, you know, she lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah, and she'd and love she to a, see it. She talks a little bit with a southern accent. Yeah, but you've never, when you watch this tonight, and if you know Mary in person, you go, how did you do that? You know, but we have all these English and Australian actors now doing American that uh, amazed me too, so she did a beautiful job. Now, is anybody familiar with uh, a new line of soundtrack CDs called the Legacy Collection from Walt Disney Records? Yeah, yeah. Hey, it's the Mary Poppins one, isn't that awesome? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a fantastic collection of soundtracks, and today they just released one for Sleeping Beauty. Is this a plug? Well, it could be, yes, it's a very subtle okay. plug. Now, do you guys like the music from Sleeping Beauty? Yeah! How much do you like it? Oh. You like it so much that when you leave tonight, would you like a copy of this?
Well done. Now, let us continue with our grand occasion. Yes, the 55th anniversary is at hand, and we have a special gift to bestow upon you all. Yes, a 55-second retelling of the beloved fairy tale. <laughs> yes, you never said anything about the 55 seconds. Don't well, worry, it'll be great. Follow me, okay? <laughs> oh, like we have a volunteer, yes. a kindly timekeeper who might Moment is at hand. We now give you the classic of classics. 